Uh, hi guys. Yeah, so uh, I think last time I was talking about sort of the background, um, talking about my parents, so it's been a big gap months since I recorded the last one. And I'd like to finish up the rest of the tapes tonight. So um, basically, I think we were talking about my parents, and uh, I've got the notes here in front of me. Um, sort of, yeah, all that stuff where they were uh, their background, and they're growing up, and then they're joining the Watchtower, and all those things that happened there, and um, around the time that I was born, that's when I was going to start the next tape, uh, when my life started there. So, um, yeah, it happened, uh, I was born um, in 1974, so it was a year just before, uh, you know, they were talking about the end of the world for that group, and all this crap, and um so I don't know exactly what was going on with them at the time to be having a baby and whatnot. And um, I may never find out. There's a lot of things. I may have mentioned that before where they were filtering everything, you know, later when I was growing up. And I could even sense it then. It was obvious, you know. Um, so they would filter information to make sure it fits in with sort of a, a watchtower culture or an attitude. And so there's a lot of things I kind of got part of the truth, or they may have just admitted it completely, you know. And um, so I, I don't really know what was going on exactly in their life, but I do have just things that they mentioned. Um, so, yeah, they had a lot of uh, money, apparently, at that time, and they were doing quite well, um, taking vacations. Uh, apparently, they went to... Um, I mean, by the time I was three, that I'd been to Disneyland and Disney World. I mean, when we were in Canada. That was quite kind of far. I mean, for maybe I'm guessing at that time for most people. Um, so, according to them, they were. This is their account. You know, they're doing quite well financially, and they had this large company with a lot of employees. And then they said that um, things kind of started to fall apart for them after that. And they um, they said they were betrayed by a couple of witnesses that were working for them who basically scooped all these contracts they had in this cleaning company. And then the business kind of started to collapse or something. And they ended up selling it to, my dad sold it to one of his good friends. He said um, that was in Nova Scotia. And... Um, so that would have been around the mid-70s when all that started to happen. And I remember my mom, she would often talk about that, like, in bad terms. And, you know, tried, I don't know how much it was drama and just a watchtower culture I was telling you about, you know, and she's saying, oh, everything changed in 1975 and all this stuff. And I don't know. It could have just been, you know, well, it was definitely, I mean, just for them and other people like them, but... Um, personally, in, she could, I don't want to get off topic, it gets lengthy if I have to do this every time, and try and, ex, you know, get into all these, like, facets and aspects and details, but basically, you know, she could have been, um, and I saw it happen a lot, this, um, what's it called, transference, you know, like, transferring your, something you're unhappy about and trying to make it bigger or trying to push it onto other issues where it doesn't belong or it was never actually there. But you start to filter everything like that or you start to try to make things apply where they don't apply just because it's what you're doing. It's in the mood you're in or whatever, the culture or cult. So it's kind of like the business start going down the tubes. And um, so... Uh, yeah, they ended up moving in the, around 1980, late 70s, 1980, and um, for some reason they started taking care of my grandpa, apparently, they got this place in West Vancouver and he moved in, and he died, I think, around 1980, and so I don't really remember him um, from that time, but... Um, yeah, they ended up moving to this little town, logging town on the west coast of Canada, and very small. And that's where we were for about seven years after that. So 
my brother and my sister, of course, were going to junior high and then high school. My brother graduated high school there, and there was actually a lot of witnesses in that little town. I was surprised. And young families and stuff like this, and a lot of them would, um, you know, even work in Vancouver or something like that, and they would kind of commute and stuff. So it was like this little isolated town, um, and yeah, it was weird. It was sort of like, I think things sort of, in retrospect, kind of started to tighten up a bit. So, you know, we were, I don't know, maybe it was a bunch of factors, you know, I realize now, you know, like, my parents had had kids, and they're growing up, and you know, you don't know what's going on, plus the end of the world hadn't come in 75, and there's all these things, and and um, the money was going down, and I don't know, but, um, and I don't know what it was like before, I, I don't know, This it's hard to get accurate information from them, but I remember, for example, um, I'm surprised to think of it now, but I had actually stayed over, if I remember correctly. I was very young, maybe six or seven years old, and I'd stayed over at this kid's house. They're really nice people, but they weren't witnesses, and my parents had let me stay over at their house for some reason with a, a few other kids. And uh, I think, I, I hope that my memory is correct on that. And, and that definitely changed shortly after, you know, and I remember actually... Um, things getting really ugly and my sister for example one of these memories i had that was very critical where my um my sister was talking with my mom and she was just on the verge of tears I, but it got to the point it from then on it was like she didn't cry actually at all because it was so horrible she couldn't cry you know we're all like that you couldn't let the emotion out it just started to sort of rot in you because you knew you were trapped but i remember she there was this really nice east indian kid that lived next door really timid with glasses you know in, in nice girl you know in this you know kind of family and the older brother was studying to be a doctor or something and you know really really nice kids and my mom was took my sister aside and was like kind of, you know, in hushed tones of saying, you know, you can't hang out with her anymore because she's not in the you know, witness and stuff. And my sister was so upset. This was like her only friend, you know, in, in the area. And here she had to do this sort of, you know, and make it look like it was all her desire to do that. It was not. She was wanting to cry. You know, it was awful. Not in a good way either. Like a bad way. Like hurting kids, you know, kind of cry. Like, you know, getting upset. And... Um, and I remember my sister at that turning and with this anger in her face would look at me and my mom and she says, well, if I can't have any friends, he can't have any friends. And my mom was kind of like sheepish, but kind of like knew that was going to happen, you know, because, well, of course you have to be consistent, right? And I remember, of course, as good kids, we would all uphold this and try to push it through and, and make it into our own heart, no matter what, if it kills us. So we all became very, you know, um, we always were, I guess, you know, um, very, you know, pushing away people that weren't in the watchtower and all that crap, all those little rules and details that go with it and attitude above all, sick attitude. And so, and I remember it, it sucked for everybody. Um, and my sister, Another memory was, I remember this was in the 80s, you know, and she had this white jacket on. We're going to the hall, and my dad was, like, yelling. He was so upset, and and she had this makeup, kind of all, like, white powder she used to put on her face and, and just wasn't happy, you know, and this kind of, like, death look almost, you know. And, um, and me, and my dad was like, what's the matter with her? She looks like she lost her last friend, you know, and she's yelling. My, my mom's kind of... My dad was yelling, kind of my mom is, like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, and trying to kind of like smooth it over or something. But, you know, that, and I just remember thinking she did lose her last friend. You know, we didn't have any friends then. It was like just getting pounded into us again and again, all this crap. And if you don't know what the Watchtower taught then, and I imagine it still teaches, is horrible. Look it up. There's tons of stuff on the internet you can find about how young people aren't supposed to have friends. You know, you're not supposed to be a part of the community, you're not supposed to have a job or a career or money, and you're not supposed to do all these things or have fun. In fact, they would say, literally to people, if you're happy, there's a problem. 
you shouldn't be happy in this system of things. You should be miserable. Like it says, Jesus said the, you know, the, um, you know, I forget the, and he was a paraphrase, you know, happy are the miserable people who are crying and sighing because the end of the world is coming and they're going to be all get that reward in paradise and all this stuff like this. So they would make a point of smashing it into you that you can't have a career, you there's no point to an education, in fact, it'll lead you astray and all this stuff. And But you should finish high school because you don't want to get a bad reputation from Watchtower, you know, dropping out. And, um, oh, by the way, they, you know, a lot of other things little things that try to make themselves look good, you know, and, and stay out of too much legal trouble. They don't want to get shut down. So these like idiot things. And it was just miserable to grow up in that. And then um, my sister dropped out in junior high. Um, she was not fitting in, of course. Well, you can't fit in with school when you're not supposed to. So, um, and she was really unhappy. And she became sort of almost like a, a sickly child and kind of under my mom's wings all the time couldn't work couldn't do anything and we're just kind of hanging around the house and we moved from that little town to a, a series of moves over the next uh, couple of years um i can't remember i counted it up but i changed schools like seven times or something during the next year or two, and it was just awful. It just started to really get horrible then. Um, we moved to Vancouver, and uh, that was actually pretty awesome, but then we were there for just a few months. I remember there was just weird things. My dad was getting really upset all the time, and um, they're talking always about money and all this stuff. And uh, I remember actually just before we left that little town, um, once my dad just he wasn't normally a violent person but i think they were stressed out or something i remember he took my head he's upset at me about something and there's something dirty in the kit in the bathroom or something and and uh, he took my head and he pushed it into the sink and i gashed my forehead open on the faucet you know i still got a scar and um then shortly after we moved to Vancouver, I remember I thought he was going to kill me once. He just had this rage come out once at something. I something stupid, nothing serious at all. He's a very good kid, you know. And um, very frightening times, you know. And we and we were in. Um, I started high school then. This is grade eight, you know. And and uh, it was actually I really liked it there. Um, generally speaking, kind of moving to the city. But then we moved again. We moved to Toronto. And then six months later, they moved to the East Coast and bounced around a bit. And finally, I settled in Halifax, you know. And uh, But I remember it started in it's just the stress of always having to. And the harder things got, the kind of tighter in I pulled into trying to be a good follower of the Watchtower, you know. And, you know, praying and studying all the time and... Um, it got harder and harder because every school, you know, it just got worse and worse. And um, ironically, my mom later tried to, you know, one of many diversion techniques to get the attention. Off. It was always something else was the problem. It wasn't that they told us you can't have any friends. You know, we're being raised in a cult. Oh, no, that couldn't be the problem. So they would studiously coach us ahead of time if there was a situation where that would look like it was the problem and we'd have to lie to people or teachers or whoever and like make it look like we really want to do this or something and um i remember one thing my mom said was oh oh you know all those problems you had later were from moving or something and oh and oh i tried my best but i couldn't i know i understand if you're upset at me about the moving or something and i remember my brother was latching onto this and using it to attack me later and it angered me so much because i had never once criticized them for all the moving and all the poverty and everything else and hassle we went through never did I ever even hint that that was the problem? They made it up as an excuse. It was so obvious that this watchtower crap and their selfishness and following it was the problem. And, but they would never go into that. And uh, that angered me so much. And that was one of many, many things, these sort of, um, these cop-outs. You know, it's really angered me. It's one of the many things that I started to get disgusted with them of late when I, I'm kind of realizing all these things now. You know, and it's really upsetting um but um anyways my um yeah w when we're moving around even this is the irony 
in every single new school I went in place, it's actually, there was people there to help me, there was opportunities, and I, and I had to turn it all down because of what the Watchtower taught. And that's what angers me. They, they sabotage people's lives on purpose. It's much, much worse than just neglect because you're actually, the, the, my parents were, and were putting effort into ruining my life and training me how to ruin my life. You know, so, for example, in Toronto, new kids there, a lot of new kids, and we went in, and the, the school, they're really nice. The, they, they the teach them, like, yeah, we're used to kids moving in and all the time. We've set up this nice program where we, we help kids get in, and the teacher's really nice, and there's new kids all the time, and um, they brought in the most popular kid in the school, and, and they got him to, like, try and help me integrate and show me around. And, you know, he's nice, and the teachers were trying to help me out or something, and I had to basically take a distance from them and I was very polite but kids are not dumb especially that age 13 14 they can sense that you're you're trying to be different and that's like a death sentence you know in, in um, that at that age and so and especially for what not different as discipline like it's improving your life like somebody trained to be a, a I don't know a skater or something that has to be different no this was different for the sake of being unhappy and ruining things and all this this shit that they throw at you anyways it just got worse and worse and i remember started getting like ulcers actually i was only 14 and i started getting these really bad stomach pains from the stress uh, of course i start getting attacked by people because you know it's a great target at that age when you're purposely trying to be different and uh, we'd move again, and in Halifax, same thing happening. And I remember I just had enough. I, I had a, I just, I, I refused to go to school again after the fourth or fifth school I'd changed, and we were at that point in uh, in Halifax. And I just, I said no. I said to my parents, I'm not, I, I'm not going. I, I can't handle it anymore. You know. And they were so happy. I think that I was not making any mistakes as far as being a witness and following the watchtower so carefully as praying all the time and studying and just trying my best and um they didn't have to even check on me because it was like they'd trained me to do it myself you know and uh they covered they were just happy to get me out of school i think as well so they put me on correspondence and they went through all this hassle to do that again taking me out which isn't good for kids at that age but i mean what what can you do when you're trying to ruin someone's life? You know, that's for this watchtower that, that was just a natural one of the many wrong things that happened. And so I got on correspondence. It's basically like homeschooling but with no teachers or anything. They just send you a stack of books and you're supposed to do it by yourself and they hope you have tutors or your parents can teach you, which they couldn't. So I did very poorly. I mean I, I tried my best, but there was some things like math that was just about impossible chemistry, things like that, and so um, after a year, I tried to go back to school, and at that time, I just had enough. I had a complete overload. This was starting high school. This would have been grade 10. Um, we didn't have any money. It sucked. I mean, for a long time, I didn't own anything that was new, basically. You know, I, I, all my clothes were from... Uh, these secondhand stores, and I don't mean cool ones, I mean it was not cool at that time, it was like stuff, you know, like a, a pair of pants for 50 cents, this kind of stuff, and it was, um, again, I could use that as a positive experience, except this all just added up as why, and the reasons I were given didn't make sense to even a child, they were so stupid, and I realize now it was all selfishness on my parents' part and on people that are involved with that cult, it's selfishness. It's a way to dodge the hard responsibilities of really trying to raise children properly and well. There's a lot of dancing around and it can be painful and, and stressful and self-sacrificing to raise kids properly and to be knowing when to let go and when to try to make them happy and know it's they're not your little dolls that you can hold under your thumb and, and do your little life thing through and and it doesn't matter what happened to you. Trying to push that onto the next generation is wrong. You know, my parents didn't see that. And they didn't, I should say, didn't want to see that. And they just were very selfish about following through their own um, desires in this cult and didn't think about us like that. And so my sister was totally fucked up. She couldn't even hold a job. She couldn't speak properly even. Sounded like a 
some shy 10-year-old, 12-year-old or 7-year-old, <laughs> I don't know, you know, and, and we were miserable. And um, I remember that would have been 1989, and uh, in, it would have been October, I think. And I'm, this was like a very uh, critical time. So there's a couple I want to mention here. Sorry, I know this is all over the place, but I want to get these video, these audio tapes done or I'll never do it. Um, yeah, so that critical time, there was, we started moving around then, and at that time, you know, 13, and things start to really hit. And I remember it was 89 then, and we were on the East Coast, and it was miserable, it was just dark all the time, and uh, starting this, going through all this again in this very scary high school, and... Um, as a new student there, and I remember I had enough, and I remember being so unhappy, and I came out, I, I closed, I slammed the locker, and I was getting picked on again, and it was the same thing, there had been some really nice kids in the class, and I had to take a distance from them, and it started getting horrible, and um, I said that was enough, and I was prepared to die and I was just I knew that you know there's just so much wrong you could just feel it it was not like challenging hard this was just wrong hard like there's something wrong with this whole thing the whole watchtower thing the, the this whole situation I was growing up and it was just wrong and bad and I could feel it but I was completely trapped and I was 15 years old and I remember getting on a uh, mountain bike I had <laughs> And I drove out to the bridge, and I was seriously going to jump. And there's this huge bridge over the harbor. And I started cycling out, and I got about a third over the bridge, and I was really gunning it. And out of nowhere, this it was a it was a it was police, but it was a bridge patrol truck. And I didn't realize that this he suddenly comes over and pulls me over. And he he was uh, he's nice, but he's like, oh, you, you know, there's no Kind of, you know, very stiff though, you know, and he's there. He's like, there's no uh, foot traffic on here. You can't take a bicycle on. And uh, I was shocked. And, and, you know, I was just about to jump. I was psyching myself up for it. And I, it stunned me to see this guy come out of nowhere. And it was like a, I, I, I just sort of went, I uh, guess, you know, and I was a good kid. I wasn't used to <laughs> disagreeing with the police or anything so I was just sort of like shocked and I was oh oh yeah oh, oh sorry and I just pretended like I was going over the bridge normally and so I turned around I went back with him to the other side and he escorted me through the gates you know and he's kind of like checking it out but that was just a fluke and I didn't realize I guess they must watch the bridge all the time and have these bridge patrol cops on there that's all they do so it was complete fluke I got stopped partway over, didn't jump because of this cop. Nobody knew about it. And I don't even, I can't remember if I even told my parents about it later. It was just so miserable, you know. And I was willing to take my chances with God in heaven and everybody because I, I, I just wasn't fair. Everything was so unfair and miserable and trying so hard and I was miserable and it didn't make any sense. And... um it's terrible, you know, praying and, and just, it felt like there was nothing there. And uh, <laughs> that happened a lot. Sorry, I got to pull emotionally back from this because I won't be able to finish these tapes. Anyways, um, so after that, it was, I think, about March, February or March, February, actually. Yeah, so there was a few months past. I went back to school and just uh, kept on doing it. It was like I couldn't focus. Everything was just, you know, it was like one of those bad teen movies, you know, where it's just your head's buzzing. I just can't focus on anything. And it was horrible. And then I had a complete, I mean, all the hypocrisy we're seeing in the hall. I, I This would be a long tape. I went into everything, why it sucked. But I'm hoping you can imagine why it would suck. Um, the These just these paradoxes happening all the time it was it was wrong the the watchtower is wrong everything was wrong about it and everything was sort of collapsing and i think it's maybe actually 
in a sense, it's a blessing that my parents had all these problems. It made it easier to see what was happening. If my parents were rich, which often I saw a lot later of witnesses like that, or comparatively rich and comfy lives and everything's, they get a nice little career lined up that's still under the radar. Those people maybe have it so well that they are never going to see the real truth because it's, they don't have the motivation of pain, I guess. They're, they're kind of um, living a pretty comfy life, at least in Western countries, you know. So um, in a way that, yeah, that was that. So uh, where was I? Yeah, so anyways, um, a few months later, I had this complete breakdown. And I mean, f just full-on breakdown. I was 16, I remember I just turned 16, and it was awful. Uh, where we're living, everything sucked, and I won't go into all the details, but I, I had a complete breakdown where I just couldn't stop crying, and I remember we were trying so hard to be, we're supposed to be happy, they kept telling us you're the happiest people on earth, because like in your heart, because of what you're doing and all this stuff, but I was so beyond miserable, I don't know, miserable is like pure, it was it was worse than that. It was like one of these gray no man's zones where it's all, it's like having a, a dull headache all the time and you're, you know, getting really depressed and, you know, it just sucked. It, it was like, wasn't even a good fight. It wasn't like one thing or the other or even like I've heard pain described like that where it just gets over with. It was like this sort of, because you, we, they, we were trained to push ourselves into it. So I was actively participating at this point in the misery and forcing myself into it. So, for example, if we'd have a negative thought about what was going on, I had to get it out of my head. And it was normal for anyone to be not happy in this situation, and it, and it didn't make sense. But when I would have that thought, I thought I was trained to think there's something wrong with me and it's the devil trying to get me and all those things. And I would literally, I started to smack my head at this point, I, I, nothing made sense. I saw hypocrisy in the hall, and I'd get these rude answers to me. I was getting attacked when I'd go out. My parents were, you know, were having all these, these money problems that, and saying these things to me it didn't make sense, and, and, you know, guilting me into things, and then still trying to show me love sometimes in the form of what was convenient for them, um, a very conditional love, I should say, as well. But it was so confusing and it really fucked me up badly and I just I remember like trying to get for example the negativity or out of you know out of uh, just that one example of trying to get negativity out of my head so I started smashing my head into the wall and I couldn't stop crying and my my, my parents were kind of you know getting upset and it was just one of those ugly ugly um scenarios because it, it's there's no way to fix it there was nothing that I could done and I don't know if anybody else could have done anything at that point because my parents were fighting to keep us into that church of course um, especially as I'd find out later you know they were prepping ahead of time putting all this work into make sure that making sure that the reason that my sister and me were getting sick and depressed was never addressed the core reason would never get touched and they would hide behind the Freedom of Religion Act and all that kind of um, stuff. So basically, um, yeah, I, I had this breakdown and they called over another elder that they liked in the hall and then uh, he was really stupid. Of course, nobody has any training for this, you know, but they pretend they're experts and, they, you know, you would never go to a doctor or a counselor, never, you know, or you'd never let me live a normal life. You would call somebody up and figure it out yourself in two minutes. And so he just gets me in this wrestling grip. And I just remember I, I just felt so trapped completely. And he's like pinning me on the floor and I just can't stop crying. And they end up calling the police to escort me down to the, he's like, oh, we should call the police to take him to the hospital. He might try and run away. Because I remember I just wanted to, I had this feeling of being trapped, and I wanted to get out. And I remember saying to my parents, I just want to, because I used to hike a lot in the woods, and I was like, I just want to get out of here. I, can I just go walking in the woods for a while or something? Like, no, no, uh, no, you know, he, we don't know what he's going to do or something. We've got to keep him in. And, and they're getting me in this wrestling move. And 
I just I couldn't handle it anymore. I, I couldn't get out even physically then, and I was freaking out. And they said, "Well, we got to escort him down to the emergency room. Maybe something wrong with him physically, or something like this, or something else." And um, I think they were probably even they did definitely later, but maybe at that point they were even saying, "Oh, it was like demons or something," you know. And so they're getting all in elder mode and being idiots to me and um, take me down basically, yeah, to the emergency room, and then. Uh, I remember uh, it was so ups embarrassing. I mean, can you imagine? You're 16, you've got all these things, you need help and support and friends, and this is what you're getting? Oh, you know, no career, no school. I, I, I could go on and on. I, I just, this, I'll never finish these tapes. Anyway, um, yeah, so this complete breakdown. They take me down. They end up um, injecting me with the syringe. I don't know what was in it, but it was some sort of tranquilizer, I imagine. And I remember I literally was knocked out for about two days. I lit, I actually was like out completely. And I woke up, I remember a couple of days later, and I was locked in a cell and it was very ugly. And it had like this sort of cage wire stuff on the window, very small. And, um, there was a door, and uh, there was a food tray inside, and I was on the floor on this like rubber mattress thing, and so um, yeah, they basically take me to the emergency room, and then um, tried to talk with me, the doctor. Of course, that's not working. My parents had trained me ahead of time, you know. And now it's you can't say anything about the. They didn't have to say that to me. We knew. You know, your misery and yet has nothing to do with the watchtower or being told you're not allowed to have friends or not allowed to have a career and you're going to die soon. You're going to be tortured to death by the teachers, maybe, or the police. Or, you know, so you can't trust anybody except the, the, the people in the watchtower and the congregation. And But those people in the watchtower and the congregation were hypocrites and doing all kinds of bad things. And they were much worse. Well, there wasn't even any young people close to my age, for starters. And the, some tumbleweeds we did have come through that were at least close, they were way worse than a lot of the people I knew at school. So it was just a complete hypocrisy and fuck up, you know. And they, I knew from being trained in that ahead of time that I couldn't discuss any of this with the counselor. Counselors were also bad. So you get this sort of paranoid, schizophrenic kind of nightmare where everybody, it's a conspiracy theory, basically. It's a giant conspiracy theory. Everybody's out to get you. You know, it's like, well, why am I at the hospital at all then? Why are we doing this? You know, and I was just completely um, destroyed by this. And I was still, though, I never, ever gave up on the, you know, the praying and this, I'm, I'm a witness and I'm 100% trying. I was doing it all the time. But it's just a really unhealthy lifestyle when you get down to it. And it completely snapped the hypocrisy and the paradox of that whole culture. So basically, yeah, I was uh, then kind of, they put me on all these drugs, which kind of really fuck you up then, because then it's completely out of your hands, like you're really having a hard time to, to cope. And that went on. Um, I was in for, I mean, a couple of months, basically, on a, in an outpatient basis. I mean, they held you in for a week, at least. And um, I think they took me home for an afternoon and then, you know, they start slowly letting you out. And it was like a kind of a in and out basis. Then I started these correspondence courses again, but it was hideous. That was the absolute awful worst time of my life. It was like this kind of um, in and out of, you know, um, the hospital and of course everybody knows what happened you know so it's this it ruins can you imagine being 16 and and this is what the word is going around to people you know and, and it was just awful and um so i was forced onto these prescription drugs and essentially addicted to them i, I couldn't get off and that went on. I didn't actually kick the drugs until I was 21. And that's another story for later. But so you've got, what is that, five years? You know, and all during this time, 
Um, it was awful. It was trying to piece together slowly bits of high school, a very crappy quality of education I was getting, and working part-time jobs, you know, cleaning or... Um, I, I even I worked as a bag boy at the grocery store part time, sucked and uh, oh it's awful and um, yeah so it was just horrendous and I, I don't even want to get into it all it was just sucked so bad so that was 1990 that happened and then later finally um, in 1995 I started to break out and. Um, I should say, that I think about a year before that, I started to really change. I was trying everything I could to make sense of the situation I was in and to make the watchtower work. So, uh, ironically, it was my parents, I think, had started to sort of encourage me to be more, like, try to make more friends around in the hall. Normally, they'd be very critical of everybody because, it, it, with good reason, I mean, it, nobody really was in our area was following what the watchtower was telling i mean there's something to criticize about everybody you know especially the young people there and um, like i mentioned a lot more worse than people at the people i knew at school some really nice kids at school but of course they're evil can't hang out with them so yeah anyways later um at um yeah when i was 21 uh, yeah, started to finally get things together, but um, I got uh, like in a little bit of trouble about a year, maybe six months before I left, and I was just, I never, for example, had a girlfriend, I never even touched a girl at all, and I remember, uh, I think it was 20, yeah, and I started to just not care about a lot of things and it was this living in this hypocrisy all the time and taking its effect on me and it was like a uh, i just realized how sucky my life was even it was obvious you didn't have to study it to know i mean i could just compare with other people just look around you know i'm addicted to prescription drugs i don't even have high school education i'm living in my parents basement um i don't have any job skills even except being a janitor you know, and my parents have nothing con positive, you know, to offer me. Like, it's it's all just negativity and guilt and trying to run me down all the time with this Watchtower crap. You know, and all this stuff I had done just meant nothing, you know, to anybody. And it was just garbage. And, you know, praying all the time, and I just felt nothing there. And I remember I started to try and make it work, so... Like I said, ironically, I started hanging out more with other witnesses in the area, which were not good. So the closest guy to my age is a younger guy in my hall. And I remember, just to give you an example, he's like, oh, man, you got to get some new clothes. Like, clothes, you know, sock. And I, I had all these, like, stuff from these Frenchies or Thrifties or Value Village or whatever it was called, you know, these really used clothes, you know, and... So I was like, yeah, man. He's like, yeah. And we're talking with him. He's, he, you know, he's saying, oh, yeah, a five-figure discount or something like this. You go and shoplifting, basically, right? And so I went through a phase for about three weeks. And I started, like, stealing things out of stores. And I just didn't care. I was at the point where I just wanted to feel alive by anything, you know. And it's like I kind of understand that. You know, I studied a lot of this later in psychology. It's interesting how these things, which I didn't know anything about, were sort of, happening you know and, and just when you're so miserable for so long and you stop caring you know and it's like you know i understand why people will abuse themselves now you know or they'll you know you get these people inflicting injuries and things on themselves that are depressed or these other things and i think a lot of it they just they're sick of the feeling and they want a change and for me that was part of the reason i remember when they, they caught me you know after about three weeks and uh i remember that you know, they have a cop escort out of the store or something. And I was like, you know, I remember saying to him, I was like, you know, I'm kind of glad I got caught. And he was a nice cop, actually. He's like, oh, yeah. I was like, yeah, you know, I meant it. You know, I was like, at least I, it's kind of over now. And I, I had this feeling like I just wanted to try something different to break out. And I'd also tried a couple of other things. Um, nothing serious, just really stupid things. I, I had, uh, 
I went to a pub. Yeah, and I was drinking. I ended up getting drunk because I didn't, I, I never drank. I didn't know what I was doing. It was on my birthday, by the way, once, you know. And another time I went to this university pub and I just wanted the atmosphere. It was young people and they were active and doing something positive with their life. And it was so cool just to go down. And I used to go down on purpose just to hang around near the university campus, you know. And um, it's a bit like that movie Goodwill Hunting, you know, when he's comes just wants to be kind of in that atmosphere you know it was a bit like that 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 phenomenon with me so i was um hanging around there and and uh, i remember i tried a cigarette once i asked somebody for a cigarette i remember she was like whoa why are you doing it or something because i luckily i couldn't stand it i didn't like it but um yeah so uh nothing again it was nothing i didn't hurt anybody i didn't do anything wrong but i just was wanting to find a way to make things work it didn't make sense oh yeah there's another interesting story I, I shouldn't even mention this it's off talk it doesn't matter but um yeah i tried this gambling machine at this pub and ironically there was another guy who was sort of a witness that saw me and he took off and then he kind of came back and said oh hey, or something like this i saw you here and i had money in the machine next to you <laughs> and i took off i was like oh yeah i don't care or something so i really didn't care at that point so anyways, um, so I, somehow my mom had found out about the shoplifting thing because I, well, I, I wanted to do it all on my own, you know, but it, she made a big deal about that. And of course, um, and later used that years later against me as the reason, nah, she wouldn't even dare to try that to me, my face because, um, she knew it was out of line to do that, but they were trying. She tried to hint. I, I don't know. Again, so that's another story. I'm very angry about that, but um, they wouldn't communicate even with me directly later after something else fell through. They were trying to do so. They wanted to come up with any reason to justify why they're shunning me, for example. So she would make reference. Or I didn't. I heard indirectly through my brother who was trying to mock me through a mail or something about how. Uh, my mom said that I'd been caught stealing and that's why my sister didn't want to see me. And it had nothing to do with that. And my mom didn't mention that until I'd stopped going to the meetings and then she started suddenly coming up with all this. It didn't seem to be a concern before. But when I started getting my life together, ironically, together, that's when she started trying to run me down. And this is one of the many things that really angered me about these sort of grasping at straws that is the absolute worst thing that they could dig up on me. There's nothing. I was perfect kid in every way as far as like honest and really trying and I gave everything I could into it. And at uh, the end, they knew that. And I tried to face them and talk with my mom and dad later and they caved instantly. This is years later. But um, anyways, I one, I didn't get them involved in anything and I didn't want anything from them. I didn't ask them for anything. I just wanted to be free to live my life, you know, and it was horrible that they'd done all this to me and other people and my sister and, and ruined everything like this, you know, but I remember when I was 21, I got out and, uh, sorry, long tape. Yeah. Anyways, when I was 21, so I got out. Uh, I started to, what happened? Yeah. My parents, that's right, they had retired, semi-retired. They found out about this place, caretaking a hall. Or sorry, yeah, to back up. I ended up moving out for the first time. This was in Halifax still. And um, it was right around this time I'd gotten caught in the shoplifting thing or whatever. I didn't care and I was just wanting to get out. And it was just before I moved out. You know, and this guy had been asking me. He was uh, supposedly a, a witness. You know, it's an idiot. Some of the people I had to really associate with are assholes, and um, I would never do that now, regardless of who they are. But because we were witnesses, I was forced. You know, there's nobody else, right? And so anyway, this guy ended up betraying me later. But um, I was. I moved in with him. He just wanted somebody to split the rent on this place that he liked. He couldn't afford it himself. And 
Um, that place caved through. Nothing new to me. Just you couldn't live there anymore. The landlord was going to do something else with it. And then these other guys I knew asked me to move in with them, and I was kind of like couch surfing. But it was horrible. It was like I started getting really depressed. And around this time, I didn't know what I was doing. I was cleaning, and um, just everything was going down, you know. And I couldn't even I didn't want to like work at that anymore. And I didn't could have gotten very ugly and stuck in Halifax in this in Spryfield, you know, this really ugly situation. And these kids were taking off. They're going to go their separate ways, go stay with their parents for a while or whatever. And my parents had. All right, by this point, I'd already moved out to the West Coast again, and they'd gotten this job, or sort of this deal, taking care of a kingdom hall. They're as caretakers, and they're living there. So I ended up moving in. Or sorry, I wasn't sure what to do, and I talked with my brother, who had just moved down a while earlier to Halifax, and um, they encouraged me, luckily, to get out of there. And, and they say, yeah, yeah, I should go live with mom and dad. they got this nice place. And my mom and dad were wanting me to come out. And I'm really glad that I got out because I went out and it was nice. The West Coast, there was more money flying around. There was more jobs. I mean, it was sunny there and warm when I got there. And it had been snowing, you know, when I got on the plane and Halifax. <laughs> and it sort of felt like a drug rehab or something, almost like, you know, those stereotypes you know they come to this farm or something because it was out in the country and it was just nice to get away from get a fresh start somewhere and um i remember being with my my family there my parents but it was still i mean it was a horrible life but i was just glad i didn't it didn't sink any deeper i seriously could have become like a homeless person or something in halifax and it was very, very close to that happening. And, um, yeah, so I got out, and then through an employment office, they had this, I didn't have any skills, right, but they, they had this sort of deal where they were encouraging, you know, these shops to hire people, and they would pay half the wage and stuff. So I got a shot at this job that they wanted somebody, and um, they really liked me, and it was in a, a construction, you know, and then, uh, I worked there, and um, so it was right around that time, I kind of, uh, a few things happened. Um, I Again, I was just trying to make sense of everything, and it's a very weird life, but I, I ended up moving in again with another idiot, um, this gorgeous townhouse at a resort, and it was owned by a witness guy who used it as an investment and he had had this witness guy and his friend living there and this guy wanted me to move in to help him with the rent again this this two young guys this one guy was moving out and he was an absolute idiot and uh i remember his friend came over and he got really drunk and he's like smashing things and then he disappeared and he, this guy was such a jerk he had got me he gave this he said, oh you got to pay your damage deposit to me or something like this and he's like took a damage deposit which i found out later he never paid and then he left in the literally in the middle of the night just after i moved in he stole all my rent money and the damage deposit and went his brother was going to get him a job in alberta at earl's restaurant or something and then i was stuck and i i had this job in construction it didn't pay that great you know um and it wasn't you know, very stable, but they liked me, and they, they were trying to help me out, so um, I was working there, and then I was at this great place, and it was a great turning point for me, because I ended up, I was like, you know what, this, I started to not care, I, I didn't go to meetings anymore, I didn't really care, and I was like, you know, just fuck them, you know, and um, I put an ad up, that's right, I was trying to just live a healthy, good life, and it was hard, because my family at this time were just being really difficult with me, so I stopped talking completely. I didn't really want to see them. My, you can imagine, you know, parents living at the hall as well, kind of in overload mode, you know, or whatever, and it just sucked. And so I put an ad up at the gym. One of my very smart decisions was I tried to keep my health up. So I made a point of trying to eat a relatively balanced diet and to 
exercise and I saw the value years ago in helping me to kind of you know at least one thing I could do was exercise and try to stay healthy and that helped deal with a lot of the stress because I seriously could have died after all that stuff that happened at 16 um, seriously it was I, I can't get into it all but it was really bad like I, I would have probably died from anxiety and depression related issues you know that were ironically it wasn't nothing wrong with me I was just caught in a horrible like a horror movie almost you know of a, of a life there in this watchtower thing and so anyways um, I put an ad up at the um, gym and I got a call a short while later from a guy and this was a big move for me because this was a quote worldly guy unquote and I remember when he came over I was a bit surprised he was this big guy and he had kind of weird fashion sense and he it was wearing like black or something he had this black I remember this black uh, like ski cap type thing you know this black you know the one that cat burglars wear or something he's wearing and he's like a lot of muscles and stuff a big guy and I was like oh I just remember thinking oh boy but you know I, I was desperate I needed I, I couldn't last you know I would have lost gotten kicked out of the apartment I had nowhere to go and um, I didn't want to rely on my parents I knew they would uh, I should mention my dad had actually locked well not locked me in but they made me sleep out in the woodshed out behind their cabin on the Kingdom Hall property because they were angry that I had stayed out late one night and um, so you know it really sucked and I I was determined to it just wasn't fair I had this again limitations of this video format but um, I, I can't express enough how just this it was truly unfair what had happened to me growing up and and not just bad things happening to me or being neglected or something that actually is I think manageable what really angered me was the brainwashing and the trying basically all the work that went into my parents and family going in this direction and also training me to injure myself and sort of mutilate my own life and, and ruin it on purpose so that they'd have good slaves for this watchtower uh, group and that's what was really bothering me and this how unfair it was all the effort that went into that for this crap that was for nothing you know for them and so I I didn't want to ask for anything from my family and anything so I, I took this roommate on very good move because I'm still friends with the guy now I mean this is a long time later that would have been in 95 1995 you know and him and he brought another guy over and he's like hey you know why don't we have two roommates or something because it's a big place with three rooms gorgeous gorgeous place and um it was in a resort like i mentioned on the beach there was a hot tub outside and we were getting it for a song because the guy was a witness that you know renting out to the other guy and um anyway so we these two guys moved in awesome roommates and that kick-started my kind of new life social life I met all these friends in town uh, uh, they were helping me this guy was this big guy he was completely avant-garde very unusual guy um, and he worked as a bouncer too at one of these nightclubs in, down in the city nearby so we went down there and um, he was like a vegetarian and I found out later he was like bisexual or whatever and just very unusual guy but he was really nice to me and um uh his his friend that he brought along ironically he we used to have a lot of talks it was very therapeutic at the time anyways um because he was raised as a, his mother was really into the seventh day adventists which has some similarities to watchtower and it was just amazing it blew my mind to hear some of the things he was talking about you know and to that amazing feeling when you're meeting somebody totally different but you see some of the same techniques or whatever used in that religion that was used in the watchtower so some and some wildly different things that made it all the more charming but anyways um, I 
really liked these guys, and I made a lot of friends through them, and they were really nice to me, at least at the time. And, uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so it was a really cool thing. And from then on, it just started getting better and better and better, and it was like one thing after the other that I would work for it, and it would happen, and it was so healthy. It was just good, and it was a sort of upward spiral. I could think of it like that. So I had... God, how many good things happen? Um, I don't want to get into too many personal details. It's a public video, but, I mean, I got a girlfriend, for one, a really nice girlfriend. I had her for four years um, until I broke up with her. But, um, yeah, I, I got a job. I mean, I was doing, and I, I started to upgrade my high school education through the community college. And then I that led into being able to meet more people and the kinds of things I wanted to do and the people I wanted to hang out with that were doing something with their life. And from then, I was able to actually get into full-on college and from there to the university, and then I graduated with a degree. Um, before that, I actually, I took a year off and I went overseas, and that's when I met um, a girlfriend who later, actually, is now still my wife. And uh, after that, I came back to Canada and I finished this degree, and I moved back overseas. I got married, I've had kids, um, I started uh, a few years ago a company that's doing well enough to support a fairly large family I've got now. And, um, you know, quite awesome. Just, I mean, things just went better and better and better. And I've got so many memories from so many things I did over that time. And above all, it was just, it felt healthy and positive. And there was obviously some scary points, like anybody's life, you know, and there's challenges. But the irony is that I was getting no help at all. In fact, I was getting actively discouraged whenever I'd try to talk with my family. And the awesome things that happened were so good, you know, that just blew me away. And um, so this upward spiral of just good, good, good things. And it's just, it's kept going on, you know. And of course, I've had life issues to deal with. But I can honestly say um, the things that have really... There, well, I'll still get into another video maybe, but there was some permanent damage done to me when I was growing up, you know, and, and that those things were hard to, uh, the hardest to adapt to and to make my life turn around. And the irony is that you get these problems that one thing compounds on another. So, uh, by example, um, I heard this just to give you an example of the phenomenon I'm talking about, uh, I remember listening to this native Indian girl and she was talking on the radio and what she said really struck home for me. She was, she had gotten out of a re Indian reservation and there, some of them are awful places, you know, and what she said made sense. She'd gotten out and she's like, you know, I, I didn't realize how good, like, you know, kind of, paraphrasing her but you know how healthy life could be once I got out of that situation and it was very hard for me to go back she said because you know I saw these opportunities and then I go back and I see it's not just that they're held down or something but they perpetuate the problem themselves like she said these people who are wasting all their money on alcohol and drugs and a good analogy she said was this car it was up on blocks with no wheels and people are this idea in their mind that, oh, it just needs some part and then it'll be, everything will be like it was before. And that part is never coming and it doesn't need one part. You know, it's like, but it's junk, you know, but everybody's yard has one of these cars. And, um, you know, basically the idea she's saying was that these people get in this mindset and they're stuck there, you know. And, and so um, for me, yeah, just, I forget where I was going with that, but um, yeah, getting out was really important for me and to be able to see just how horrible it was to be stuck there. So um, yeah, that damage that was done to me though, um, you know, the the just like that reservation or ghetto mentality, you know, that's what I was thinking of, was that how it's not just the actual physical problem that was there, but the culture tends to compound problems and create new ones. And that's where the problem was from. And then if somebody does want to get out, 
it's even harder because they're not just dealing with starting from nothing. They've got all these sort of negative marks against them already to make them even heavier to fly so they can't get off the ground. And that's how I was because something would happen. For example, I started getting my education going, but you know what I noticed? Everybody around me had at least one person in their family who was rooting for them to do well in college. And in many cases, they had a place they could stay for the summer and, and make money during a job to pay or even having their education outright paid for. And I'm not talking just about money, all that's important, but mainly it was the moral support. And this is something that hurt me so bad. And later at my graduation, you know, for example, if people... You know, people getting up and their family going, we're pretty darn proud of you, yelling out like this at, the, at some of my classmates. And it hurt me so bad, you know, to, again and again, actually, I wasn't hurt anymore. I've been through this so much, you know, through my life with my parents just trying to run me down when I was doing something positive, you know, and it really hurt um, to have to deal with these things. And and when people ask about social problems and whatnot, I can understand very much how that is the case, you know, how you, you, it's not just like you give someone a job and everything's fine. It's these emotional landmines that really, I think, do a lot of the damage, possibly most of it, because, you know, weird things that happen. I had to fill in a form about life insurance, for example, in this uh, new job I got, and it required me to list my next of kin. And I wasn't married yet, you know, and I I, I, I froze. I, I couldn't, you know, they're staring at me like, what, you know, who's, don't you have a brother, sister, or your parents or something? And I, I, I didn't know their address even at that point. And, you know, people kind of look, what, what's going on or something, you know, and I, it was things like this. I didn't even want to be connected with them, you know, in that way. It would freeze me up because it was just so horrible. I have to deal with all this crap with the watchtower with them, you know, or... um I bought Christmas presents for some kids and, uh, you know, it was just the, the, the timing, but they're complaining about the, how, the cost of them or something. And I just had this emotion wash over me, these emotions, these negative emotions, because I didn't have any Christmas presents at all. And I would certainly not complain about them if I had gotten one, you know. And um, Here I was not in the mood, but I was trying to get in, help, you know, into it for the kid, sake of the kids, you know, and and uh, that that things like that, you know, and and uh, the other person involved was kind of criticizing. You can tell they're kind of sour about it, and that really bothered me. So things like there's these landmines, I could call them, that are planted by a bad past. Um, it's not a very elegant way to put it, but I, I hope you know what I mean. So there's this sort of damage that's been done. But ironically, one of the reasons I want to make this series of tapes is because I kind of feel I'm getting to a point where things are changing. I don't want to get into too many details, but um, I may very well leave all of this Watchtower crap behind and forget about it all now, pretty much, I mean, in, in reality, just from being busy with other stuff. So I kind of felt the strong need, though, to make a marker of some kind, sorry, or a... Uh, <clears throat> I wanted to get something concrete like uh, um, about my experiences down and I thought it would maybe help other people as well as me and just to that, you know, you get that feeling like you want to have a, a memorial or a, I don't know how you term it. Um, yeah, something, something solid to leave for other people to notice. So anyway, uh, yeah, so all that crap got out. So, where am I? Okay, so that's the basic story. I've jumped over a bunch of stuff because I didn't want to get too emotional or whatever. Or, don't have time. What else did I want to mention? Okay, so, um, yeah, I hope I made it clear that my parents... Well, sorry, the, the watchtower was basically the tool that was fucking everything up. But I've come to realize, especially after having my own kids and, and going through challenges and raising the family and talking with my wife and her family, how much work goes into something like raising kids and how I think the Watchtower is, makes dirty shortcuts for people because they allow people to, you know, they just 
not just wash away all the holidays and, uh, and education and having to save for their future, all these things which are quite traumatic sometimes for people to deal with, or it's a lot of work and planning goes into it, you know, and they kind of wash it all away. Oh, the new system will take care of everything. This kind of very selfish um, approach to things. But also what it does is, um, I forget where I was going with that. I'll get back to it, I'm sure, later.